Well, I'm joined now by the former head of US forces in Afghanistan, General Stanley McChrystal, who's just written a new book called Team of Teams. General, in your book, you ask the question, why were we losing? Now, that was applied to al-Qaeda in Iraq, but could equally be applied to IS now. What's your answer to that question now? Well, I think for ISIS, there are probably two big reasons and many smaller. The first is that the region is collapsing politically. It has lost the stability of the status quo, which we were familiar with, and probably much of that needed to change, but that's left things in, a, in an unsettled state and, a, and an unclear political narrative for the future. The second is ISIS is a phenomenon that we're really not prepared for. It's a 21st century terrorist organization wrapped up into an insurgency, a more popular insurgency. We are still thinking nation state, we're thinking conflict, we're thinking traditional modes, and we're trying to fight with a loose coalition that isn't really connected into a team of teams as it has to be. And yet we've got this asymmetrically committed enemy. So when David Cameron talks about crushing the head of the IS snake in Syria, is that something that can be done? Well, I think it has to be destroyed and, and certain things have to be done, but crushing the head of the snake thinks in terms of nation state models. Mm -hmm. Really, the head of the snake for ISIS is the ideology that binds them and allows them to be almost a franchise-like organization that uses information technology and connectivity to bring in more recruits and execute operations. So how on earth do you defeat that, that well, ideology? I, I think there are several things. First, you are going to have to put military pressure on the on the organization, but not expect that to defeat it. Second, you're going to By which you mean airstrikes? Well, airstrikes and other activities. Ultimately, it's going to take people on the ground. You don't control ground from the air, so it's going to take a combination. And that's going to mean they're going to have to be troops from the region, hopefully Sunni Arabs that help them to solve the problem. Then the next part is you do have to take on the war of ideas. That's hard for the West to do directly. It really needs to come from the Muslim world, which has a great stake in doing that, but they need to unify to do it. And then the last thing you need to do is provide a political narrative of the future that's credible to people in the region. Because right now they have the opportunity to look at ISIS and say, well, they're, they're a little crazy, but they've got something they want to do. But What's the you, opposite? But when you talk about Sunni troops, you talked to the Sunni tribal leaders, and that was a big part of your success in tackling al-Qaeda in Iraq. How many, though, in your view, have now defected to ISIS? Well, I think quite a few, uh, and I, I certainly couldn't put a number. The real problem is there's not a Sunni uh, opposition on the ground of the significant scale against ISIS. And so if you think about it, if people don't believe there's a real opportunity, it's hard to, to recruit people to the cause. If they don't believe an opposition to ISIS and or Bashar al-Assad is credible, it's hard to get people to sign up. Have you spoken to any of those Sunni tribal leaders that you used to have contacts with? I have not in this, uh, in this mode. Um, UK involvement is obviously a hot topic of conversation here at the moment. Is there a sense that because of, as Lindsay was saying just then, the, the limited firepower of the UK, that in a way it's a greater diplomatic help than a military help? Well, there's military significance to every contribution, and the UK, of course, brings tremendous capability, particularly expertise. But it's really important to be there, even if the means available don't equal the size that the, org that the, the nation might want to field now. It's really important to have British forces shoulder to shoulder with other coalition partners against this. But troops on the ground, I mean, that's not politically achievable in the UK or the US, in your view? It's not in the near term. I suspect that what we're going to see over time is there's going to have to be people on the ground in small numbers from many nations to include nations in the region. I don't think a single nation is going to do it, and I don't think that it will ever be done by a majority of Western forces. But at some point, I think there's going to have to be troops on the ground to create the kind of stability Syria is going to need. When you use phrases like in the near term, I mean, how long do you think this battle against IS is realistically going to go on for? Well, I think it's a decade or more. But if it's not IS, if IS were to burn out or be destroyed militarily, it will be the next version. Al-Qaeda was the first. Al-Qaeda in Iraq was 2.0. ISIS is 3.0. There will be a 4.0 with maybe a different name. But it will be the same desperate sort of desire to create a movement that, that pushes against the status quo. And that's going to have to be addressed. What could the West and Barack Obama in particular have done to prevent ISIS getting off the ground? Well, I think 
political stability. There has to be a direction in which the region's moving that gives people in the region some sense that there's an achievable outcome. As long as people have a sense of hopelessness, they don't have economic, social, or political opportunity, they're going to get desperate, and they get desperate in different ways. Of course, in Syria, the drought pushed people over the edge, but people in the region, in many of the countries, just don't believe in the status quo that has been their experience, and we're going to have to change that sense going forward. But how much has Western inaction, and, and in particular Obama's unwillingness to really tackle this, been fostered that? It's very hard to tell what caused something in the past. I would say going forward, what we're going to need is leadership. This is not going to be something solved by America or Britain or the West, but we are going to be central players in it. We're going to be key. Who's the leader that you most rate to tackle this? Well, at this point, I'm still waiting for one to, to stand up and identify well, himself. Donald Trump says, bring you back. Um, I, I might have a different view. <laughs> well, look, you battled al-Qaeda in Iraq and uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan, and now you see this chaos in, in Syria and Iraq. Do you ever look at what you've dedicated your career to doing and think, actually, you doubt whether military action was what was needed? Well, I certainly think that you can question whether the invasion of Iraq made sense, and you can certainly question whether we did it well. But once we got into the fight, I think we started to learn and do better. I think we should take real lessons learned from the standpoint of we've got to understand the problem before we take it on. There's a tendency in the West to see things in fairly narrow or superficial views and then leap to action. This is an area that's so complex. If you touch it without understanding it, you're going to pay a price. And so what I would urge is as we go forward, we really need not to say we won't do anything, but to educate ourselves before we do anything and how we're going to do it. You never wish you'd adopted a different vocation? No. I loved the Army and still love the people I served with. General McChrystal, thank you very much for talking to us.